Entrevistamos Joe Salerno, diretor acadêmico do Mises Institute, que falou sobre o ressurgimento da escola austríaca, os contrapontos com o pensamento atual e sistema monetário. Acompanhe a entrevista. Professor Salerno, thank you for coming to Brazil. It's an honor to have you here. It's my pleasure, Ilio. Okay, uh, you are the editor of the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics. How do you see uh, the production of, uh, of scholarly work uh, today as compared to the, the past? It's vastly superior to the time when I first started. Um, I was a graduate student uh, during the South Royalton Conference. There were very few people writing. There was uh, Israel Kirzner, Henry Hazlitt, and of course Murray Rothbard. Um, there were no applied studies, or not very many applied studies, because there weren't enough economists to, to do these things. There were treatises, there were theoretical studies. But what you're seeing today is um, a, a complete reversal of that. Now you're seeing a tremendous amount of articles on applications of uh, uh, current events. Where we're seeing studies of, of, of the boom and bust, the housing bubble, of financial markets, and on and on. And, and much of it is finding its way now into the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics because we have many more people in academic life, and that is a key thing to have. Uh, what do you think is today the influence of the, the Austrian school, and how does it compare uh, to the 80s or the 90s? Um, regarding the influence on the mainstream of economists and on financial journalists, we are now being noticed. Um, people like Paul Krugman, Brad DeLong, um, these leading macroeconomists now feel that they have to actually take account of the Austrian theory of the business cycle and attempt to refute it. Of course, they're doing so on the basis of very little knowledge about the Austrian school. But that, again, is something in our favor, because we know all of the Keynesian macroeconomics. They know little, very little about us, so we sound much better when we criticize them and when we give interviews and when we um, write for the various media. Uh, what's your impression of the, the charge that some economists uh, and economic schools like the uh, Ch Chicago School, that uh, the Austrian scholars are basically just philosophers or talking about uh, politics uh, because they do not, do not like very much empirical data and statistics and regression. And All I can tell you is um, for, for people to take a look at a scholar like Murray Rothbard, who was a theoretical economist, wrote a great treatise on economics, Man, Economy, and State, but also the very next year published a book on America's Great Depression in which he gave us a lot of data, in which he gave us an interpretation of an empirical, an important empirical event in the 20th century, perhaps the most important, which was the Great Depression. So Austrians today are using theory again to, to apply that theory to explanations of everyday events. We're hardly just philosophers, though we make sure that we start from what we consider a true basis in deriving economic laws. Um, one uh, important and, and theme yeah. that we discuss among Austrians is the question of the uh, federal uh, of the uh, fractional reserve uh, uh, of the banks. Uh, how do you see that discussion, and what's your uh, personal view on that? I think the discussion, to some extent, has gotten sidetracked into a, a strictly discussion over the ethics of fractional reserve banking. Um, I see that moving away from that now uh, with um, Werther de Soto's book on uh, money and, and, and business cycles um, and, and I see us moving more towards a discussion on the grounds of economics which I'm much more comfortable with. Uh, whether or not there'll be fractional reserve contracts in a free market is besides the point. The point is will fractional reserve banks be viable in a free market and will such contracts be able to be drawn up in a way that um, respects the distinction between having property at all times at your disposal, a bailment, and loaning money, okay? If, if you come up with contracts that allow fractional reserve banking, fine, but let us see then how the fractional reserve banks perform when they cause a credit boom and then have to suffer the consequences of a run on, on, on their um, uh, deposits. Um, what's your view on the, uh, on the, the continental tradition of Europe uh, and the history of economic thought? Uh, it's, it was uh, almost always forgotten uh, and was recovered by Murray Rothbard and you. Uh, how do you see uh, that work now being uh, recovered, uh, the scholastics, the Italian, the French? I want to mention that even before Murray Rothbard, there was Raymond DeRuva and Marjorie Grace Hutchinson, who also saw the importance of, of the, um, the scholastics. 
Uh, what I see is that we have given a new foundation to economics and a new foundation to the theory of subjective value. In fact, this goes back much further than Adam Smith's cost of production theory, though Smith got a little bit of the subjective value theory. And what we see now is that Europe itself was a very important um, starting point for economics. Italy, Germany, um, France, uh, J.B. Say, um, uh, an economist named uh, Her Herman uh, from, from Germany. All of these people were in the uh, what we would call the subjective value tradition, and these are the people that the Austrian, the early Austrian economists, Karl Menger and uh, Eugen von Bambaver, drew on when they when they when they uh, presented their their initial works. Um, the, we're seeing today in the world uh, more and more crisis, and we are currently under one crisis: the credit, the big credit crisis. Right. How do you see the international monetary system evolving from here? I see problems with the euro. I see that Germany is now refusing to, to or, or at least is very reluctant to bail Greece out. That Germany is um, is insisting on sticking to the original, um, I guess, constitution of the European Monetary Union uh, and uh, and the uh, European Central Bank. And I, I see fractures occurring. Um, these countries like Portugal, like uh, Greece, and Italy. Um, have been getting a free ride, in a sense, from the strong euro, which was based on the German mark to begin with. And I think that's going to come to an end, that free ride. And uh, I, I see the euro zone breaking up eventually under, under the weight of deficits and under the weight of, of national um, questions about national sovereignty. Do you think we will, in our lifetimes, uh, still see something different than uh, a fiduciary media money in the world? I think that if we have some more of a, a crises that, we, that have affected us in, in, in the last decade, uh, housing bubbles and so on, which I think we're destined for because they have gotten the causes wrong, I think with more of these, you're going to see people looking around for alternative monetary arrangements. That was true after the 1970s. If you recall, President Reagan impaneled a committee to study the gold standard, a return to the gold standard. Now, it was dominated by Chicago economists and eventually they recommended against the gold standard. But I think you're going to see the opportunity to re-examine the gold standard again. And by gold standard, I don't just mean gold, I also mean possibly silver or any other market commodity that is chosen by people for their, for their everyday transactions. Uh, of course, uh, if things go into the, in that direction, the governments are going to fight back. And one of the ways they are fighting back is trying to consolidate more power in, in uh, treaties, uh, like the European Union, the NAFTA, and try to centralize uh, not only monetary uh, aspects, but also fiscal aspects. How do you see that, that process going? Um, I see what they're, uh, uh, what they're trying to do is, is to sort of get everyone to inflate and run deficits in a coordinated way so that no one country um, suffers more in terms of depreciation of its currency than another car, uh, uh, currency. But I don't see that as working. Uh, again, you go back to what's happening with Greece in, in the European Union. Um, some countries are going to be naturally less responsible, more imprudent than other countries, and you're going to get frictions uh, uh, that, that lead to the breakup of those sorts of organizations and treaties. I'm very hopeful of that. Okay. Um, you studied uh, the Argentina uh, crisis in the past. How do you relate that to the situation that Europe is, is, is experiencing today? Um, what happened in Argentina was that um, basically the IMF gave its seal of approval to Argentina as investments, as, as an inv a, a good place to make investments, as a safe place to make investments. So you saw a lot of, of, of capital pouring into Argentina, um, and, and, and you saw the Argentine government on the basis of that allowing an expansion of the money supply that eventually caused an inflation and caused a, a, a depreciation that led to the dissolution of the currency board. Um, and I, I'm not sure that that exact sort of scenario is going to occur in, in Europe. I, I think it's going to be a little bit different because you have other countries involved. Uh, Brazil today is uh, one of the BRICS, so it's, uh, it's becoming part of the mainstream discussion in financial and economic uh, newspapers, and etc. Uh, but still we have an economy which is much regulated with an enormous red tape. Uh, um, how, do you, how do you see um, countries such as Brazil that are 
uh, consolidating a mixed economy. Uh, how do you see they, uh, their, their role in the future, especially now that it seems that this sort of management of, uh, of economies is doing well uh, with respect to the crisis? Now, initially, that sort of um, arrangement is going to do well because initially they have to deregulate like China has done and like India has done. And that gives a boost, a boost to the market economy and spurs growth. But as that growth continues, there's going to be more taxes generated. And the government's going to get more greedy, it's going to make more promises, and eventually it's going to, in a, in a way, stifle that growth. So what I see happening is that uh, a pendulum swinging back and forth. Nesta segunda parte, o professor Salerno fala sobre a teoria das expectativas racionais e como conheceu a Escola Austríaca de Economia. Joe, you hold today the position that Murray Rothbard had of uh, academic vice president of the Mises Institute. How do you see um, uh, the spring up of different institutes all over the world, this bottom-up process of, uh, of institutes uh, appearing all over the world? It's a great development, Elio, and I know Murray Rothbard would have loved it. And I'm certainly gratified by seeing so many institutes springing up with the names of great Austrian economists like Mises and Hayek. Right. Uh, what's your impression of, of Murray? Um, I will talk a little bit about that at, at our conference, but um, Murray was, of all things, extremely humble. He was an extremely humble man. No matter what sort of a scholar you were, for example, myself, I, I, I was such, certainly a much less, lesser scholar than himself. But any sign of productivity, Murray Rothbard always took the time to write a letter, make a phone call, and to encourage you to continue to write, to continue to uh, you know, advance the Austrian and, and libertarian agenda. Uh, how do you take the charge of the uh, rational expectation theory of the neoclassicals that uh, the cycles are not caused by the ABCT, that people would expect uh, the, uh, governments to do that and could react to it? Yeah, that's uh, it, nonsense. It's laughable. The point is that people are not economists. That's why we teach economics. Um, if people could actually predict the, 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 um, the cycles, it would imply that, first of all, they have uh, a, a theory of the cycle in their heads, the correct theory, which we, we know that's not true, and secondly, that they would be able to figure out the motivations and the expectations of the Federal Reserve System, which sets the whole thing in, in motion. And thirdly, something that Mises pointed out, initially, yes, interest rates reach very low levels. So that might warn people that there's going to be a cycle. But then, as inflation heats up, interest rates go to historically high levels, and people misinterpret that in the beginning as being tight money, and they think that they're on firm ground in making these investments. So, um, once again, I would dismiss the criticisms of, of the rational expectation people. Joe, uh, going back in time a little bit, yes. how did you first uh, became acquainted with uh, Austrian economics? The first time I, I became acquainted with it was in the History of Economic Thought class when one of my professors, uh, when we went over the school, he talked about it, and he said uh, that the Austrian school was a movement that existed in the uh, late 19th century, and he said it was a very special movement because all three men were very brilliant, and they were all devoted to promoting the same idea. It was only the very next year that I found out that the Austrian school actually had members that were living in today's world, and that was Murray Rothbard. I was given a very small pamphlet called Depressions, Cause and Cure, and I read that pamphlet in 45 minutes, and it changed my life because I realized at that point that everything I had learned in, in my principles of macroeconomics and intermediate macroeconomics was just nonsense and that, that it, it, you know, it, it didn't explain the real world. It wasn't based on, on, on real human action. But in, in, in a very short pamphlet, in 45 minutes, I learned why we had depressions, how depressions were actually caused by inflation, and how the depression itself was part of the cure for that inflationary boom. Did you become a libertarian at that event, or uh, there, there was uh, any other event that, uh, that made, made you a libertarian? No, I, I, became, I became a libertarian about at the same time, or maybe a little before that. Um, 
when I had read a magazine, um, or actually I read the New York Times magazine, and they had an interview with Murray Rothbard. So I guess it was a little bit after I read that. And I realized that not only was he an economic theorist, but he was also a major libertarian thinker. And so it was at that point that I became a, a full-fledged libertarian. Joe, thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Thank you.